is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross then mercy and grace forgiveness and love eternity can be yours hallelujah let lord jesus christ shine forth good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are joining us welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries and tonight we have privilege of having Robert Spencer with us. I am sure like 99.9% .9 of you already know who he is. Uh, peace of Christ be with you, brother. And with you, thank you. Um, is your 27th book out yet? No, it will be oh. out next year, just the 26th. The 26th is coming in January, just a few weeks now. Okay, so be, I just finished writing it a few days ago and it will be out in the fall of 2023 unless the world has exploded before then. Well, you never know what jihadis might do. 
Um, yes. How have you been, sir? Thank God, very good. You? By God's grace, I'm good. Thank you. So um, I think you've been following up what's happening um, on social media. Let me share my screen with you. And I just thought I invite you and ask you to help us um, what is happening in the world of the heart. Uh, let me just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. So this year apparently been very difficult for some of Muslims. <laughs> yes. Uh, they are very much struggling and suffering and they are going through hard jihad. Yes. Um, would you be kind enough and then tell me uh, what are your thoughts on what you are seeing on the screen? It's, uh, just, it's intentionally misleading. I'm assuming it's from an Islamic source. Yeah. And it's designed, however, to make non-Muslims complacent about jihad and think, oh, this is nothing to be worried about. No need to be concerned. It's just being patient and smiling uh, and uh, taking care of your parents. My goodness. Uh, this is the only thing that's true here is struggling for good deeds because jihad means struggle. and. Jihad is struggling for good deeds, as a matter of fact. The problem is that in Islamic teaching, in the Quran and in the Sunnah, you have violence against unbelievers being considered a good deed and various other things. So when one struggles for good deeds, it doesn't mean smiling and being patient. It means beheading people and, and stealing their possessions and raping women and so on and that's all struggling for good deeds as far as the quran is concerned so um while uh, muslims are like so uh, struggling with jihad um also it is not in this picture but there is another one uh a muslim missionary who is heading to qatar to do dawah he's expressing his jihad is to uh, set up GoFundMe to uh, get money to go to Qatar. Yes. Um, some of the Muslims are struggling um, very much. Um, so you express that this is the kind of image Muslims wants to give out. Um, why would Muslims want to represent uh, like this very well-known word differently than what the Quran uh, states? Well, they know that non-Muslims, for the most part, have not read the Quran and have no idea what's in it. And also, they know that non-Muslims think that religions all teach that you should be good. Because every religion in the world teaches that you should be good in various ways, and generally they agree on moral teachings, except for Islam. But people don't know this. So they capitalize on the ignorance of non-Muslims in the West and they're trying to make them take their guard down and not think this is something we need to be concerned about. This is something we should perhaps be, be uh, wary of in inviting large numbers of Muslims into our nations and so on. So you have um, written 26 books. Um, you've kind of looking, you are doing weekly uh, jihad um, in the news um, you've got you are even out of the word of Allah um, in your studies have you come across um, let's say until 15th century the word jihad is used in a context of smiling in the difficult moments trying to be patient in the hard times or try to be kind to the, my parents um, or is it always been used in the context of struggling in the name of Allah to take the life of individuals who are not Muslims or sometimes Very, even Muslims? Is it, it technically jihad means struggle, and there are all kinds of struggles. So that it is true that being patient or taking care of parents in a certain sense is a jihad. Technically, this is true. But the primary understanding of jihad in the Quran, in the Sunnah, in Islamic history, is warfare against unbelievers. That's the struggle that it's it's primarily concerned with, that all those sources are primarily concerned with. And in the 
history, you very rarely see. There's that weak hadith that dates from the ninth century where Muhammad is coming back from battle and says, we're going up now from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad. And this is something that's uh, quoted very often in the 21st century, once again, to lull unbelievers into complacency. But the hadith is not only considered inauthentic by Islamic scholars themselves, but also that was never the primary understanding of jihad in Islam. And warfare against unbelievers has always been the principal way that the word was understood. Okay, thank you. So, um, to, tonight I thought um, it would be helpful for us to kind of bring some of the highlights of um, jihad uh, with the Quranic definition um, and traditional definition uh, of this year. Um, it's all, you're almost finished, but you never know what might happen in the next 15 days. And lots of things can happen until today. Um, Besides uh, how Muslims are trying to be patient in the times of difficulties and it is very hard for them to forgive, blah, blah. Um, what are the kind of couple of highlights um, of 2022 for you? Probably the main one is the uprising in Iran that is not jihad but against jihad, that the Iranians have had 40 years, 43 years of Islamic rule, and they're thoroughly sick of Islam. Uh, the American government is dissembling about this and trying to give the impression that it's just reform that the protesters want. But the protesters themselves have made it very clear, we don't want an Islamic republic. They're saying this explicitly, and that's something that can cost them their lives just for saying this. So it's an extraordinary manifestation of courage and also an extraordinary manifestation of disgust with Islam that they have lived with all these years and they know what it's all about and they know what jihad really is and what Islam really is, contrary to the rosy view that most people in the West have and they've had enough of it. Um, so I'll ask you kind of question which idiots will ask. Uh, what, Islam is supposed to be a very beautiful religion. Why people who lived under Islam, um, Islamic Republic for 43 years, um, they are happy, they are not happy at this stage. What went wrong? You're absolutely right. Most people would think that this means that they're not Islamic. And you see this being said nowadays. I saw an Islamic apologist on Twitter just a couple of days ago saying just because they call themselves the un-Islamic Republic doesn't mean that they are Islamic. And actually all that they're doing is completely against Islam. This is a lie, however. And the Iranian people know it because they've been forced. They haven't had any choice. They've been forced to study Quran and forced to study Muhammad. And they know what Muhammad taught. And they know what the Quran taught and teaches and the, these things are the basis for islamic law that is being implemented in iran so what went wrong is islam went wrong and islam went wrong right from the beginning it was not as if the islamic republic departed from the beautiful teachings of the quran the islamic republic is applying the teachings of the quran and consequently it is being uh, it is it is repressive, violent, misogynistic, hateful, uh, authoritarian, and so much more. And that's why the people are disgusted. It's precisely because it's Islamic that they're disgusted. It's because of the aspects of Islam that are being forced upon them that they are rising up. So um, I don't know how it is in the state, but in UK and in Europe, uh, Muslim people want Islam and Western people who are not Muslim, they just like, wow, Islam is very nice. We want it too. Like we can live alongside with it. What, is, what are the kind of couple of uh, teachings of Islam would um, help us to question actually Islam cannot live alongside of 
non-Muslims, as well as um, Islam takes the, I don't know, very basic right to um, choice of freedom, um, ch choice of love, uh, leave it or die it. So uh, what are the kind of very basic principles you can put, um, you can tell us um, Mus Muslims and non-Muslims cannot live um, among each other according to the teachings of Islam? Well, take, for example, chapter 48, verse 29 of the Quran, which says, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. Those who follow him are ruthless to unbelievers, merciful to one another. So imagine if you have a society where uh, half the people or a significant number of the people believe that they need to behave ruthlessly toward the other half while being kind to one another. This is just a, a asking for societal strife and difficulty. You have a society where half the people believe that the other half are the most vile of created beings, which the Quran calls unbelievers in chapter 98, verse 6. How can you have people living in an atmosphere of mutual respect if one, one group thinks the other group is the most vile of created beings? There is nowhere in the Quran and nowhere in the teachings of Muhammad as they're written in the Hadith and the Sirah literature where it says, live as equals at peace with the unbelievers. That is not an Islamic principle. It nowhere appears. The idea of Islam is that it must dominate and subjugate the unbelievers under the hegemony of Islamic law. This is not something that every Muslim may want to pursue, but it is the teachings of Islam. So you're always going to have people in any society where there are Muslims and non-Muslims thinking we have to work toward the subjugation of the non-Muslims. And so there will be trouble between those Muslims and the non-Muslims. So while in UK and in Europe, Muslims are asking for Islam to be practiced and Westerners are like, oh yeah, we want that. And in Iran, people are running away from Islam. I know like lots, uh, not thousands, but I know lots of lots of ex-Muslims who turned to Christ um, leaving and left Islam. In Muslim countries, people are running away from Islam. They are leaving Islam. They are turning to Christ, or they are becoming atheist or agnostic. So, what is the what is I'm trying to make sense of what is the view of Islam for Muslims who live in West versus view of Islam who lives under in Muslim majority countries. One side doesn't want it, versus other side wants to uh, wants it to be practiced. Well, the people who want it to be practiced in the West aren't living under it now. And so they can have a rosy view of what it would be like. And also, it's a certain kind of party spirit that they think this is our group and we ought to be in charge. We're the best people, as the Quran says in chapter 3, verse 110. So if they're the best of people and the unbelievers are the most vile of created beings, obviously they want to live under the rule of the best of people. And they don't really know what that's like. They may have come from it, uh, or their parents or grandparents came from it, but it's not like living living with it every day as they do in Iran. And so it's a very different situation. In Iran, whether you like it or not, you're confronted with Islam every day in every aspect of life. Yeah. In yeah. Britain, you're not. Even though you see Muslims everywhere, and Islam is growing in influence, still the laws of the land are not Sharia yet. They will be soon. Sadly, it's coming. Um, okay, so one of the highlight of um, this year um, on Jihad is what is happening in Iran, and it is still going on. Yes. Um, what, are, what is the second highlight? I don't want to say as a highlight, because uh, it is pretty ugly what Islam does to humanity. Uh, Let's say, what is your second peak of jihad? Probably the growth, the resurgence of ISIS in Africa. Uh, you have ISIS in Nigeria, the Islamic State West Africa province. You have the Ash-Shabaab jihadis in Somalia. 
and another group also called Ashabab in Mozambique. So in South Africa, East Africa, and West Africa, you have significant jihad movements. And in Nigeria in particular, there are attacks virtually every day against the Christians in the country and massacres. And the government is ruled by a Muslim who doesn't do anything about the jihadis. And as a matter of fact, has taken a great many of them that were claimed to be reformed, de-radicalized, and put them in the military. So now we, we're starting to see jihadis in military uniforms attacking people, Christians in Nigeria. Now, they may be real military. They may be just that they got the uniforms from their friends or something. But there's no doubt the government is not doing anything to stop the jihadis. Whether it can or whether it won't is a question of that is very hotly debated. And I see this from contacts that I have in Nigeria who are convinced that the government won't do anything and is actually hoping to aid, hoping that the jihadis will win. So in any case, you have them now not just in Nigeria, but in Cameroon, in Niger, also in Mali, those are more Al-Qaeda, uh, the whole area of West Africa, there are, the military hasn't been able to stop them, the militaries of the various countries. The French were in Mali and completely failed to eradicate the jihadis and gave up and, and, and withdrew. So eventually, and maybe in 2023, you're going to have the establishment of a caliphate in that area. Then in East Africa, you have Al-Shabaab also being able to act more or less with impunity in Somalia and Eastern Kenya. And then you have Cabo Delgado, the province in Mozambique that is very near some quite important oil fields. And that is essentially controlled by ISIS at this point. So you could end up with three Islamic states in Africa and the militaries of the governments of the surrounding areas being powerless or uninterested in stopping them. And then of course, those areas are just gonna grow and continue to expand at the expense of the surrounding territories. I've been to uh, Nigeria and Somalia. Uh, I must say, um, I met many brothers and sisters there. They are so brave. Yes. The 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 way they live their life is like I think something challenges us. I live very comfortable life. I I don't think you you are as comfortable as I am, but I live very comfortable life. And seeing the um, daily life Christians go in Nigeria and in Somalia just challenges me quite a lot. And um, in that part of the world, um, they all, they explain you how the things work. So yes, you get to see a man who is wearing uh, official uniform. But actually, they are there to simply hunt down Christians. Um, life is very difficult there. So uh, brothers and sisters, those of you who are listening, please remember our brothers and sisters in um, Africa in your prayers. So yes. you are saying like um, Islamic Caliphate will be, uh, will be happening next year, which is in minimum in 16 days. Well, that's true, yes. Uh, I do think that's very possible in uh, in Nigeria and in the surrounding areas. The Islamic State West Africa province could actually gain control over a significant expanse of territory and declare an Islamic State there, as they did in Iraq and Syria. And that would still be there if the, it had not been that Donald Trump became president of the United States and crushed it. Otherwise, Obama was not showing any sign of interest in, in, in making that go away. And certainly Biden wouldn't have moved against it. So a lot depends upon these political issues and political changes in the West. I don't know that there's anyone in the West now who would have the will or the interest in ending a caliphate if it were established in Africa. Um, so you brought up, uh 
couple of names of the politicians. Um, I usually don't do that much. In, I'm not into that much politics, even though every choice we make is political choices, even where you are going to shop. Um, I want, I, I, I'll ask a practical question. I was having a chat with a Muslim missionary regarding what is happening in Nigeria. And um, even though we get to time to time here, uh, persecution of Christians under um, Islam, uh, a res response to that was, well, um, it is America who is giving them all those guns because Nigeria is a very poor country. People don't even have like uh, luxury to live. Um, only reason they are killing those Christians because America is providing guns to them. Um, what do you think um, source of the resources for um, jihadis um, or member of Islamic states in Africa? I wouldn't be at all surprised if that were true because one of the first things that the Biden administration did when they took power was to remove Nigeria from the list of countries that were infringing upon religious freedom. The, U the United States has an office of religious freedom that's supposed to be protecting persecuted religious minorities around the world. And Nigeria is one of the worst offenders where Christians are kidnapped and or murdered virtually every day. And yet Biden's people took Nigeria off the list of persecuting countries. It was an extraordinary move. And there have been many Christians in Nigeria who, that have protested and tried to prevail upon the American government to reverse this, but they've had no success. And even worse, Mohamedou Buhari, the president of Nigeria, just recently, just days ago, came to Washington and met with Biden. And Biden praised him as a model of democracy. Now, there's no democracy in Nigeria. They have elections and they have an opposition. But ever since Buhari took over, the elections have been increasingly suspect and the Muslims always seem to prevail. And to call Nigeria a flourishing democracy and to ignore the persecution of Christians there, it's, uh, excuse, sorry about that, it's extraordinary. It's an indication, perhaps, that for whatever reason, the Biden administration is on the side of the jihadis in Nigeria. That wouldn't surprise me at all, because they seem to be on the wrong side of everything and uh, interested in t making all the choices that will harm Americans and the West in general. I, I usually know when certain words used by Muslims, their definition is very different, like peace um those kind of things and all beauty um now i am very much where certain words are used by president of us their meaning is different than democracy is very different according to oxford dictionary and it seems it is very different according to us um so we uh, as we are looking at jihad in this year we talked about the rise um in iran and rise of um, ISIS and the radical Islam in Africa. Uh, what are your thoughts on what's happening in um, South Asia? South Asia? Yeah, Indonesia, part, that part of the world, uh, Pakistan, Indonesia, Malaysia. It seems um, life is not very easy in that part of the world as well. That's certainly true. In uh... Malaysia, it's interesting to note that you have there what most people would describe in the West as a moderate country, that Malaysia and Indonesia are supposed to be moderate Islam. And yet in Malaysia and in Indonesia, in Thailand, southern Thailand, in Myanmar, all these areas, all these countries, you have jihadis and push the push to implement Sharia. So you can't really say, it's, it's kind of an indication what's happening with the implementation of Sharia in Indonesia and Malaysia in particular. You can't say that these are 
paragons of moderate Islam. You see the failure of moderate Islam there to convince the hardliners and to make their case against those who say, well, actually the Quran says this, the Quran says that, and as a result, we have to implement this kind of state. And ultimately, if they continue to be majority Muslim countries, which they almost certainly will, then Malaysia and Indonesia are going to be essentially indistinguishable from what Iran is now. There's been a sharp increase in jihad activity in India over the last year as well. And that's uh, a little bit off. The, uh, uh, I'm not sure where the demarcation would be. Is that South Asia? Uh, it's not Southeast Asia, certainly, but I, I believe it's South Asia. So India, yes, there's. Uh, it seems like the Muslims in India have become much more emboldened and aggressive and asserting the primacy of Islam. You have the love jihad phenomenon, very common in India, although we shouldn't deceive ourselves. It happens all over where non-Muslim girls and women are wooed by Muslims. They have no idea about Islam. They convert. They are often forced to convert. Their children are raised as Muslim. Uh, a lot of times these relationships proceed on false pretenses, Muslims posing as Hindus and then revealing that they're Muslims after the wedding and so on. Yeah, love, love jihad has been very active um, in, in, in India. Yes. Um, okay, um, we talked about Iran, we talked about Africa, um, we touched a little bit South Asia. What what else um, can you share with us for high, not highlights for your picks for this year? Low <laughs> yeah, yeah. Low yeah. There is a, a, a interesting phenomenon that I've noted in tracking jihad activity every day at jihadwatch.org, and I put up news stories there about jihad activity. That in very different countries, thank you. There are different patterns that always recur in nigeria that we spoke about before the, very often the jihadis will raid villages and start shooting indiscriminately and killing large numbers of people in uganda there is a recurring phenomenon of the brutalization of converts that people are muslim and convert to christianity and then the 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 Christian evangelist who preached to them and brought them to Christ or the converts themselves are killed oftentimes by the families of the convert like the wife of a Muslim will convert to Christianity and then her husband will kill her something like that and this happens again and again and again in Uganda in yeah. Europe yes so um, in England um we don't get killed, but we get like beaten. Um, usually, usually, Mr. Muslim would kind of make his wife like so green color, and the person who is involved discipling that um, sister is usually kind of visit the hospital. So it's very common in England as well, sadly. Yes, and of course, there's no surprise in that because it's not just as it's not as if. Uganda has some law. It's not about Uganda at all. It just happens that it's very common there. It's the law against conversion altogether, that the death penalty for apostasy, as Muhammad is supposed to have said, if anyone changes his religion, kill him. So it, I suppose they're moderates because they don't always kill the converts. Sometimes they just beat them up. So... Uh, yeah, I he I heard reason for that is or like um, cutting them off from the community or hospitalizing them is because they don't have the Sharia practice, they don't have the caliph, they don't live in um, big majority Muslim countries. It's just like Muslims live in that country. Apparently, that's the reason, and they think it is like better you just beat someone and then you kind of make sure they know you are after them every day. Well, certainly. If you're in Uganda or in UK, you could be tried for murder if you kill the apostate. So that's a big incentive not to do that. Yeah, uh, one is the domestic violence. Yes. 
Then in Europe, the common thing that happens in Europe that we don't see so much elsewhere, at least not now, but in France and in Germany, all through the year, many, many stories of Muslims, they go out on the streets and they start to scream Allahu Akbar and stab people at random on the street. And there are so many instances of this in France, in Germany, you know, there have been some in Britain as well. And you have the authorities in virtually every case saying this has nothing to do with terrorism. The perpetrator is mentally ill. Even though they, uh, they say the magical word. Yes, even though they say that. Yeah. Okay. okay. And even so what in some cases, quoting Quran, some of them even have the Quran with them while they're uh, doing these attacks. And it doesn't matter, they're mentally ill, they go to the psych ward. Well, they, when they wake up, I think it will be too late. That's if they right. wake up, it yes. will be just too late. Waking up is, uh, waking up is hard to do. Uh, the, uh, in Europe, for example, in France, as well as in Austria and in the Netherlands, there have been several stories throughout this year of mosques being closed down. France actually closed quite a few mosques. And the pretext for closing the mosques is that they are teaching extremism. And then you, you, you ask them, well, what's extremism exactly? Oh, it, it means that they're teaching warfare against unbelievers and the necessity to uh, subjugate the unbelievers under the rule of Islamic law. And of course, that's not extremism, that's basic Islam. And so it, either Islam is all extremist, if you want to say that, or none of it is, but it's, it's, it's ridiculous of the authorities in Europe to think that these mosques are somehow singular and that they're teaching these things. And presumably they assume that the other mosques that they're not shutting down are all teaching peace, love, harmony, and understanding. And that's, that's so stupid, but of course they are stupid. They're willfully ignorant of the teachings of Islam and proceeding as if they are other than what they really are. I think being in a place of denial is always, they think be, being in the place of denial is good and helpful. Yeah. In England, people can easily get away with such a teachings. Um, you have mosques. I've been into the mosques where they were like saying death to America, death to America. And then you go and listen to your sermon online. It's like something very peaceful. Like you're just like, oh, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so they can get away with certain things. It seems in France, people haven't kind of put, um, learned that way of deception yet. No, they don't know anything about it, and they don't believe the people who tell them. They're Islamophobes and racists, you know, and yeah. so that's that. Uh, you know, I was, I, I'm not allowed to come into your lovely country now, but uh, when I was, because I you say, can, you can. But you when can. I was last there in 2009, I went to a lot of the mosques in London. Yeah. And in the Finsbury Park Mosque, yeah, there was that's... a young man. Yeah, you know the one. Uh, he 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 gave me all these books. I still have some back behind me that he gave me, uh, Qurans and various explanations of Islam and so on. And of course, I didn't say what I do uh, and who I was, so he didn't know. But I asked him. I heard that there was some trouble here some years before. Uh, what what happened? And of course, I was referring to Abu Hamza the uh, imam with the, uh, with the eye missing and the hands missing because he blew himself up. His, his bomb he was making went off. And he is in prison now for trying to establish a jihad training camp in the United States. And he was the imam at the Finsbury Park Mosque a few years before I went in there. So I asked the guy, about this and he said oh yes we had some trouble here a few years ago there were some extremists here but now they're gone and we're all moderates and i had to laugh because a few years after that i saw <laughs> i saw that they new people had been arrested 
at the Finsbury Park Mosque. And so nothing had changed at all. Uh, not that I expected that he was going to be telling me the truth, but of course, a lot of the authorities in Britain assumed he was telling the truth and assumed that everything was okay there now. Yeah. And they have no idea that these things are going to keep recurring because they're the teachings of Islam. Yeah, I, I used to uh, visit that mosque as well. Um, I stopped. I think I lost two sh two pairs of shoes in that mosque. But um, my I, my last visit was um, when mosque was encouraging people to go in front of uh, American embassy and make a voice of some about something, and then suddenly the whole crowd stands up and I'm like, "Death to America! Death to America!" I'm just like. Yeah, I think time to go home now. <laughs> you talked. Uh, yeah, we do have we do have these peaceful mosques. Uh, very, they are very peaceful. They are very very peaceful with the definition of probably America and um, Islamic definition, not with the Oxford Dictionary. Yes. Exactly. So um, you talked about um, it is difficult to wake people up if they ever wake up. Um, You've written next. Uh, you've you've got like twenty six books. Next books are coming up. There are lots of uh, videos up there. Like you just go on the streets now. Muslim missionaries are giving out Qurans. Uh, good translation, bad translations, but there are like resources are not accessible. Um, you just go to websites. Just tells you what is um, real Islam can be or it is. Um, what do you think people don't want to wake up? Oh, they certainly don't want to wake up. Why? That was the president of the United States, Eisenhower. He was president in the 50s. And he said, it's very important that Americans have a religion. I don't care which one. They should just be religious. Uh, Americans, and I think also this goes for people in Britain, they want to believe that this is not a problem because the Islamic groups in the West have so skillfully portrayed any opposition to them or to Islam as racism and bigotry. So they want to reject racism and bigotry and think of all the religions are good and they all teach love and peace. And so they don't want to think that this could possibly be true because that would involve evaluating some, making some very hard political choices and very difficult society choices and questioning some of their core assumptions and siding with the people who have been demonized and stigmatized for so many years now. And so they just can't... Uh, they, they, they won't, I should say, admit that there's anything to this. It has to be that Islam is completely benign. I saw this just quite recently, as a matter of fact, in the United States. You may have seen that in Michigan, there were Muslims who got very angry at a school board meeting because the school was teaching a lot of LGBT propaganda, and the Muslims were very angry. And they were making it very clear at the school board meeting that they didn't want the LGBT propaganda being taught to their children. A lot of American Christians then said, this is wonderful, because they're against, of course, the LGBT propaganda as well. They don't want it forced upon their children in schools. And so I saw so many Christians saying, now we are allies we can ally with these muslims and fight the culture war and, and 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 that's great there might be something to that there might be some usefulness to doing that on a limited basis but they were so happy to see that there were muslims who they thought could be on their side and no understanding that i see among these christians of what Islam teaches about Christians, about Christianity, about getting along with unbelievers, and so on. And so they, do you see, they don't want to believe it either. They would love to see Muslims say, oh, we don't really mean any of that. 
and we're happy to live with you. And it, it is, would, life would be so much easier. Um, yeah, kind of, it, it's heart crushing how it makes sense to me when atheist or agnostic responds to Islam the way they do. But it is heart crushing to see and hear our the way our brothers and sisters respond to Islam. We did have similar thing in UK where a group of Muslims were boycotting in front of the school and then a bunch of Christians went alongside of it and then that wasn't enough. They took roses uh, even to support them. And we did have a couple of years ago Christians who invited Muslims to their churches so that they can celebrate Muhammad's birthday and that wasn't enough. So, uh, <laughs> Some Christians invite Muslims to churches. Um, they come and um, do their iftar during the Ramadan. So for them to do the prayer, they um, cover up the crosses. So it doesn't come offensive to them. They can do their prayer. Um, it is, yeah, like it makes sense to me why agnostic and atheist kind of deals with Islam the way they do. It just doesn't make any sense to me why people who claim to identify Jesus as the son of God um, who died on the cross and conquered the grave, how his followers are dealing with Islam just doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, they just don't know anything. In, in 2015, I was the co-organizer, co-sponsor and a speaker at a Muhammad cartoon contest in Texas. And ISIS attacked us, they tried to kill us all but they didn't get in. Uh, we had a lot of security and they, they got killed in the parking lot when they drew their guns and shot one of our uh, guards. In any case, so many Christians were so angry with me after that and said, this is a terrible thing that you've done. You have to treat Muslims with respect. And I said, I do treat Muslims with respect. Well, that's the, it's not respect to draw Muhammad. And so they didn't seem to understand that Islam is is something that is it, it teaches people to do evil things and think they're good. And we should not respect Islam. You can respect Muslims as human beings, but if you end up respecting Islam, then you're going to mislead a lot of people. And if you bow to the intimidation of the people who are threatening to kill because of cartoons, then you're just going to get more intimidation. And encouraging intimidation and bullying is hardly, uh, I think, a Christian stance. That, But the Christians were very upset, and many of them were certain that what we had done there was terribly unchristian. Well, I, most of times I just don't know what to say to the <laughs> uh, these brothers and sisters. There's a question for you, sir. Would you agree that America and others pay jizya for protection? Absolutely, yes. They pay it now. That uh, uh, You take, for example, Afghanistan. And the United States withdrew from Afghanistan ignominiously and with incredible, uh, in, in incredible disarray in August 2021. And since then, the American government has given the Taliban, uh, I think it's a, over a billion dollars in aid. It's supposed to be humanitarian aid, you see. It's not supposed to go to the Taliban in its military aspects or in enforcing Sharia and so on. But of course, there's no way that the Americans can ensure that the money doesn't go to the most, the worst aspects of the Taliban's activity. But in any case, it's 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 essentially jizya. And the United States pays this all over, that, that it's essentially trying to, the, the American State Department thinks, they're trying to pacify a potentially hostile group by giving it money. But what, it, what the Muslims understand it essentially as is jizya, that the, here are the non-Muslims and they're paying us the tribute as they should, as, as the Muslims must have the, uh, must be supported by the non-Muslims as the Quran directs. 
it's a gang um another question will you give out your qurans for free to muslims you know it's amazing to me i uh i'm a professional writer i write for a living i have to uh pay various bills like everybody else and it's a funny thing people would never ask your plumber or your electrician or your dentist or, or anybody else to work for free it's only writers have to work for free i had a guy uh recently on twitter he says i got your book your quran from pirate bay and it's so good and i said it's so good thank you and you stole it because pirate, <laughs> pirate bay is where you can get books for free well you know i i have to make a living like everybody else and uh I'm sorry, I can't give them out for free, especially to uh, somebody who is potentially hostile. But I mean, I'm happy to have uh, discussions with Muslims about it. I think that they ought to read this Quran because it would surprise them and enlighten them in a great many ways, I'm sure. Muslims don't give out much things for free. I know like that was a live stream Muslims were doing. They were asking people to donate to them 250 pounds 500 pounds and 750 pounds it wasn't even like five pounds or ten pounds it started from 250. yes um no they in in, in america the council on american islamic relations which is a very sinister group they give out a very large quran it's a huge edition and i think that that's actually part of the plan that a big book like that it's very it's 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 hard to read people don't and generally pick up huge massive books and read them they're for display and that's the idea that they don't really want you to read it but they want to be in the position of acting like they're completely open and transparent and so they give it to you and it's about fifty dollars to buy so they the, of course they have endless money because they get money from all over but in any case they give it out, but they know that if they gave you a compact edition, you might actually read it. So it has to be this huge one. Um, another question for you, sir. What is your take on that even the Jews here after the attack of, attack of Kurt Westingard and Kurt Tandon still will stand with Muslims' rights for Eid? So I, don't I think know. this is from Denmark, part of the world, Denmark or Netherlands, part of the world. Um, Vester, no, he, he drew the famous cartoon of Muhammad with the bomb in his turban that yeah. was the one that they really got upset about that started the Danish cartoon riots. Uh, but the it's not just Jews, unfortunately. It's leftists, Jewish leftists, Christian leftists, atheist leftists, they all will stand with the Muslims because they think it would be racist not to. And, the you know, Islam is not a race and there are Muslims of all races. There are jihadis of all races. But uh, this doesn't... Here again, it's kind of a tribal thing, you know. They think that the people who are opposing Islam are all right-wingers. And so they don't want to stand with the right wing. That's the big enemy as far as they're concerned. So they, they'll, they'll, they'll stand with the... Muslims and ignore jihad activity, it just doesn't register for them. It doesn't exist. In case people didn't get that, so Islam is an ideology and it produces jihadis. And Islam is enemy. You don't go to bed with your enemy. You don't eat with your enemy. They might give you like poison lamb or something. Don't just don't do it. <laughs> just don't do it. Um, yeah. You know, Ismail Royer, who did 14 years in prison for jihad plotting, and he got out, and now he's doing dawah all over the United States. And he wrote me several times saying, uh, when you're in Washington, let me know and we'll have lunch. And I thought, the last thing I'm going to do is have lunch with a jihadi. <laughs> <You know? laughs> didn't, didn't someone try to poison you when you were um, in That's Middle East? That was in Iceland in 2020. And that was actually a non-Muslim leftist who thought that what I was saying 
was terribly racist and bigoted. Of course, he doesn't know anything about Islam. Uh, he's never read the Quran. He has no idea whether what I say is true or not. But he just knows that the people that he respects, his tribe, they don't like me. And so he uh, saw me in a restaurant, put slipped something into the drink that I had, and I was very sick for a while. But uh, well, I'm still here. Okay, so you don't go to bed and have dinner with your enemy as a Islam also people who kind of think Islam is not enemy you don't eat with them either yes <laughs> okay That's... uh good lesson to learn um so jihad activities are taking place every day you've got website um and you do weekly shows um or weekly, up weekly updates about it what do you think as a Christian we can do uh to like what we can do i was gonna say for jihad but sound doesn't look right what we can do to stand against jihad or what is that what is christian alternative for jihad well there's several things in the first place christians should try to deal with their fellow christians and awaken them to this problem because you have the leaders of the churches all over, uh, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, and they're all saying Islam is wonderful and we are talking, have dialogue with our brothers, and they have no clue what's, how they're being played. And so Christians who are aware of these things should in the first place try to show work in their own churches and in their own uh, larger groups to counteract that mentality and show, explain why it's so dangerous. And for Muslims, of course, pray for them, but also try to engage with them wherever possible and talk to them about these issues. Be careful, because, well, as you very well know, it can be quite dangerous to do so. But that, what do we, what, you know, the alternative is to just let it all happen and then our societies will be islamic and our children will be living as dhimmis so it has to be done education yes well you've got 26 books that didn't help no you're right. You even wrote the Quran. That didn't help either. Yeah, things are worse than ever. When I started, there was it, 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 there was not even Islamophobia. Islamophobia was invented. It actually, it was invented before I wrote my first book, but it really started gaining traction after that. Uh, I would say that there's more ignorance now than ever about Islam. And so even though... I've sold hundreds of thousands of books and others. Who knows how many have been stolen on Pirate Bay and so on. Uh, nonetheless, people don't, you know, ultimately people aren't convinced by arguments. People are, I don't know what they really are convinced by, but I know that people are not really all that rational for the most part. And so you, you give them a rational case, which I try to do in my books. They don't care. Yeah, you just need to start doing these feelings things. Feelings works. How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel knowing that someone is going to come and rape your wife? How yeah. does it make you feel knowing that you are the worst of creatures because reasoning is not working? Um, See, there you're, you're giving information because they don't know they're the worst of creatures. And then if you tell them that, for the most part, the non-Muslims will say, oh, no, that's just the extremists. And you'll yeah. say it's in the Quran, and they'll say, oh, there's bad things in the Bible. It doesn't matter. Yeah, That's I've been in, into that circle yeah. quite a lot. Um, I'll bring up a question for you. This yes. will be our last question, I think. What does Robert Spencer think it is much quieter on the jihad front now compared to five years ago? Is it because the ISIS organization was mostly destroyed? Well, ISIS, as I explained earlier, is resurgent in Africa. And so we by no means heard the last. But yes, uh, the Trump years did a lot of damage 
to the international jihad. The jihad never goes away, but there are long periods in Islamic history. If you look at my book, The History of Jihad, where it, uh, there's not a whole lot of it because the infidels are too strong vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. The uh, Islamic law teaches you can't wage jihad if the enemy is more than twice your strength and you have no chance of winning. So it's quieter also because these things are just not reported. I don't know if you read Jihad Watch, Mr. O'Keefe, but if you go to Jihad Watch, you'll see jihad activity reported every day. But you go to even Fox News or the New York Post or the uh, Guardian or the Independent in Britain or uh, any number of other papers, you're not going to see any of it reported. They will not tell you that the jihadis came to Ni in a village in Nigeria and killed 50 Christians. Even the Nigerian press says they were bandits or herdsmen. And you have to know already that the, these are the media's code words for Islamic jihadis who are full of the Fulani tribe, and they are herdsmen indeed. But they're just, when they're called Fulani herdsmen, a lot of people have no idea that that means they're jihadis, but they are. They want to establish Sharia, and that's why they are killing infidels. Um, thank you for that. I did say that was last question, but this is like other half of the last question. Um, has any of your books translated to different languages? Yes. Uh, let's see. I have some over there, but... Uh, oh, I just moved things on my shelves. So. That's okay. Have you got any Spanish? Yeah, there, there is. I think the Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam, which is a book I wrote in 2005. It was translated into several languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian. Uh, Truth About Muhammad was translated into, I think, Finnish. So if you're a oh. Finn, you can get that. And uh, also, I think, Korean. Um, there are a lot of translations out there. Islam Unveiled was translated into Bahasa Indonesia. Uh, so you should be able, there, there are many, many out in I think available. People can see that on Jihad Watch website. I don't know if I have the translations listed. Maybe I should try to gather them up. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And if anyone kind of is, um, capable to translate the books just get in touch with Robert Spencer and then see if there is opportunity for you to just translate the book um, it is helpful for us to know the material it is helpful for us to teach what we learned and then you put it in practice so we break the bridges uh, which keeps people away from Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. um, that will I think the end of our live stream um, what are your last thoughts on this beautiful word jihad. I'll put the picture on the screen again so everyone remembers what it is. There's a great deal of deception. This is one example of it. But most people have no idea how they're being deceived. Americans in particular are kind of, I think, naive about that. Uh, Americans have a, a cultural reputation among Europeans of being naive. And I think there's a lot to that that they uh, think that the uh, that that everyone they're dealing with basically is honest and upright. And this is, of course, quite often not the case. There's a massive amount of deception about Islam, and most people have no idea that it's happening. So try to be critical when you see Muslim spokesmen, because they're almost always lying. I, I'm amazed sometimes at the skillfulness of the lies and the depth of the lying and the and the 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 constant frequency of the lies that even people who are respected academics, people who are professors, people who are accomplished scholars and so on, Muslims, and they're just they just lie all the time. It's astonishing. And most Americans, if you accuse someone of lying, and they like the person's politics who's the liar, then they will blame the person who's accusing and not believe the accusation. And so it just keeps going on in this way. Well, I go with the mindset of if the lips of Muslims are moving, that means they are lying. So it's like easier. <laughs> it's easier. Yeah. 
Um, thank you very much for joining me tonight and helping us to think through a couple of uh, highlights of jihad in this year. And hopefully we will have you again on different topic. And thank you very much, everyone who joined us tonight. By God's grace, we will see you on another live stream. May Christ crucified silent you with his love.